Let's talk about this piece from the New York Times. I find this incredibly fascinating. So what they did was they sat down all 21 Democratic Party presidential contenders and they asked each of them the same questions. There are 18 questions in total. And I think this is incredibly fascinating. Some of these questions are great. However, not all of the questions are <laughs> as substantive as I'd like. So for example, um, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? Don't give a shit. Couldn't care less. Like if you are getting each of the presidential candidates in a room and you're going to ask them these questions, why would that be one of the questions you ask? But with that being said, I don't want to gripe too much because I think overall this is fascinating. Now, keep in mind that I haven't actually watched these videos ahead of time, so you're seeing my genuine first time reaction, although I do kind of have an idea as to how some of these candidates performed based on the reactions I saw on Twitter. So I know that I'm going to be disappointed when it comes to Israel. I know I'm going to be disappointed when it comes to healthcare. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, I sound like Philip DeFranco. Sup, sup, sup. And let's just jump into it. But, um, <laughs> so what they do for each of these questions, you click on it and it'll give you a summary of their answers. But if you want more context, if you want to know more about their statement here, you can watch each of the candidates individual videos. Um, I don't think we're going to get to all of these because I don't want this to be a super long video, but let's just go ahead and um, we'll start with healthcare because that's something that's incredibly important to me. On healthcare, would you be focused on improving Obamacare or on replacing it with a single payer system? Yes. Both of them? Yes. <laughs> I think both. I don't see in any way that those two are mutually exclusive. I don't think we have to accept um, that false choice. My focus would be building on the Affordable Care Act. My focus would be building off of the Affordable Care Act. Same My focus talking would be point. on improving the Affordable Care Act. Same My focus would point. be on improving Same the Affordable Care point. Act. We can begin by improving the Affordable Care Act, but we have to go far beyond that. My focus would be uh, on replacing it with Medicare for All. I believe in Medicare for All. I support Medicare for All. I think the wisest thing for us to do is to have a Medicare for All type plan as a public option. No, nope. a coverage for all system. Universal coverage. Universal health care in the United States. We need to move to a universal health care system. I think we need to move towards single payer. We need to move towards a single payer system. I want to make sure that Medicare is there for everybody in this country. Well, I believe in a Medicare for All single payer program. Um, okay, lots to say there. First of all, Elizabeth Warren expectedly disappointed me. Well, would you prefer to focus on improving the Affordable Care Act or uh, replacing it? Yes. So do you understand how weak and just bizarre that answer is? Elizabeth Warren, what is your plan for health care? Yes. That's not an answer, Warren. I mean, Jesus Christ, just for once in your life, have a spine and take a stand on something. I mean, each and every single week, she's proposing these phenomenal policies, but on healthcare, for whatever reason, she's weak. She's weaker than Kirsten Gillibrand. She's weaker than Kamala Harris. How, of all people, you'd expect Elizabeth Warren to be the one to come out on top and say, look, I'm standing with Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard. We've got to move to Medicare for all immediately but she's not doing that so that's disappointing i expected her to disappoint me there um a couple things i want to touch on so when they say would your focus be on improving the affordable care act they said that basically verbatim like four candidates said it and even if the question was worded that way understand that this is a talking point by the democratic party establishment how many town halls have we seen where they're asked if they support medicare for all and they immediately jump to well i think we should improve the affordable care act Okay, but that's not really a clear-cut answer. How do you want to improve it? Um, there's, couple, there's a couple of people towards the end, like, uh, what's his name? Jay Inslee, for example, who said, we need to move towards a universal healthcare system. Now, 10 years ago, I would have assumed that that meant they support single payer, where healthcare is free at the point of service. But nowadays, when a Democrat uses the word single payer, or excuse me, when they use the word universal health care, that doesn't necessarily mean that they support single payer. That just could mean, well, you know, I support universal health care in the sense that I want to expand the Affordable Care Act so it covers like 100% of people. That's what it uh, could mean. So that doesn't mean single payer. Now, the one that I think I found the most egregious was Marianne Williamson's answer because 
she was obviously trying to do double speak. Oh, well, I support Medicare for all as a public option. <laughs> do you support Medicare for all or a public option? Those are two different policies. Which one is it? You can't have it both ways. Either you support a public option or a Medicare for all. Now, you can support a public option. That's fine. I disagree with you. But if you're going to be disingenuous and say Medicare for all because you know that that's what we want to hear, when you support a public option in actuality... I find that maddening. So public option or Medicare for all? You don't get to sit on the fence here, Marianne Williamson. Pick a side. Now, the one that surprised me, honestly, was Andrew Yang. Because when I had him on my show, I asked him this very question. Because he's been waffling back and forth between a public option and Medicare for all. And here he said very clearly, um, Medicare for all. So, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, they had the right sense to say, I don't think we should you know, um, be forced to choose between what is a false dichotomy, but I really want them to explicitly say Medicare for all. Um, but overall, I think that this was disappointing. I love how Beto here, he says, oh, well, I think we have to start by improving the Affordable Care Act, and then we just go beyond that. But you can just jump straight to Medicare for all, and then um, you improve <laughs> healthcare for everyone. It's like they're clinging to the Affordable Care Act, specifically because this is something that the last president who was a Democrat did, and they just want to preserve his legacy. I don't care about Obama's legacy. What I care about is healthcare, and they should too. So um, I'm not surprised by Bernie Sanders' stance. Of course, he's strong here. What I want to get to is the people who um, we've been following on this issue. Kamala Harris, for the most part, has been strong. Um, she kind of reversed course when it comes to whether or not she'd get rid of public health insurance or private health insurers. But let's hear what she has to say here. Well, I don't think we have to accept um, that false choice. I mean, let's first agree that the Affordable Care Act took us to a place where tens of millions of people Just get to for the, the first point. time had access to health care. And it was revolutionary, frankly, um, no, what they were able to achieve in terms of improving and, and reforming the health care system. I think we now need to take it to the next step because still in our country, so many people do not have access to affordable health care. Um, my goal, and I think the best place that we could be, is, is to have Medicare for all. And um, I support Medicare for all. Um, and, you know, the other part of it is that we have to have policies in our country that recognize that one of the biggest barriers, in fact, the biggest barrier to everyone having access to, to health care is cost. Okay. And that's, um, we that's good have for me. got to be focused she gave on the right answer. reducing in, in some situations. Okay, John Delaney is going to be disappointing. Let's hear from Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, I support Medicare for all. I think the current system that we have continues to be broken, even with the advances made in the Affordable Care Act. There are still far too many people in this country who are uninsured or who are underinsured and ultimately are not able to get the care that they need. Good. Short, but sweet. That's exactly what I want to hear. I think the wisest thing for us to do is to have a Medicare for all type plan as a public option, and then to give people the opportunity also to keep their private insurance. Oh, if they I hate want it. this. This is probably the worst because she's being so disingenuous. Like she's clearly trying to have it both ways. I hate these types of answers. Just tell me if you're for or against something. Don't try to gaslight me. I believe in Medicare for all because Good. I think health care is a right and not a privilege. And one of the challenges we've had with the ACA is we never got to universal coverage that was affordable. So I think the best way to do that is through Medicare for all and ultimately having a single payer that is an earned benefit, just like uh, Social Security today. Good. Where everyone buys in at a price they can afford, matched by their employer, right. and you buy in your whole life. Okay, the buy-in gave me public option vibes. But for the most part, it was good up until that point. But I mean, she's co-sponsoring Bernie Sanders' bill. Hopefully, you know, um, <laughs> she means what she says. But Kamala did better in that regard, as did Tulsi Gabbard. Let's hear from Warren. Yes. <laughs> yes. Look, and in fact, I'd be answer. focused on three things. The first is we need to defend the Affordable Care Act. No, we Act. don't. The we could just go straight to Medicare for All. lawsuit down in Texas 
HHS is doing everything they can to take the legs out of this it. This is a long, Second meandering we answer. Do, uh, we need to pick off the things that are easy, reduce the cost of prescription You don't drugs. have to take this I've step. Got a you bill can do to reduce all of this with Medicare for All. Drugs. Why uh, waste energy and political capital when you could just jump straight to the right policy? Insurance, private insurance, so that people don't private get ripped insurance. off. Uh, same kind of deal I set up for credit card companies. That's part two. And part three, we got to keep moving us to a place where everybody is covered at the lowest possible cost. Nope. And nope. there are a lot of different ways to get there. Medicare nope. for all has a lot of different paths. Nope. For no, it doesn't. Medicare for all has one path. You pass it. Boom, you're done. It's that simple. Hate this answer from Elizabeth Warren. I mean, you'd expect better from someone who's a self-proclaimed progressive, but that's a terrible answer. That's a corporate Democrat-esque answer. Let's hear from Pete because he has been against Medicare for all. Um, he says, I think we need to move towards single payer. Oh, here it is. The proof is in the uh, that, uh, full answer here. I think we need to move towards single payer. And the way I've proposed to do it is a kind of Medicare for all who want it. Uh, so he supports public option. See, you have to really go beyond just that basic face level rhetoric because there's so much disingenuity here that they're trying to mislead you because they really know how much we want Medicare for all and they want to tell you what we want to hear. But they don't want to say it in a direct way because they know that that'll piss off progressives. So they do it in this roundabout, sneaky way saying, well, you know, I support Medicare. They emphasize that word for all who want it. You know, it, it's so frustrating. Um, let's go to Andrew Yang. My focus would be uh, on replacing it with Medicare for all, uh, a system that provides health care to all Americans. Uh, I think that the Affordable Care Act was a tremendous step forward, but did not go quite far enough. Okay, that's good. It seems like he is coming back around to Medicare for All. It still gives me pause because um, he's waffled on it before, but I mean, this is a step in the right direction. I'm not going to bother watching Bernie's because Bernie hit it out of the park. He does this every time. He's the best on this. Um, okay, next we will go to, do you think Israel meets international standards of human rights? This is a really easy answer. It's no, it should be no across the board. But I have this <laughs> sinking feeling that they're all going to fuck this up. Come on. Do you think Israel meets international standards of human rights? I have great concerns about the role that Netanyahu is playing. You know, I think... Nope. I do. I do? <laughs> yes. Yes. Overall, yes. <laughs> I think Israel often does, uh, but not always. When you're addressing the issues around Israel, one has to look at their evolution. I believe that we can get back to kind of policies that affirm that two-state solution, affirm human rights. I do think that, by and large, um, Israel meets the standards of human rights. What a I joke. believe Israel does work to... Uh, what a fucking human rights. joke. I think there's more that could be done. Oh, I, I believe that uh, Israel, like a lot of other countries... That Sai at the beginning um, told you everything. He's going to try to bullshit wants you. Wants to do the right thing. Israel they want to do the right thing, but they're not. needs to work with the Palestinian people to find a two-state solution. Work with the Palestinian there people. There are some challenges with Israel. Oh, come um, on, that, that Tulsi. You're the foreign policy candidate. enormous challenges. Oh, fuck off. And they are our strong ally. Uh, we need a liberal democracy in come that region on. with that liberal democracy. I know that Israel attempts to meet international No, they don't. They're brazenly rights. violating um, human rights. I know that they could do a better job. Well, I think they could do a better job. I think that you all think? countries can improve uh, in all respects. I think that there are many countries, including the United States, that behaves in ways that do not always meet international standards of human rights. Um, certainly so some of the actions Israel? that are being taken there are, are deeply problematic. I think uh, Israel's human rights record is problematic and moving in the wrong direction. So they all fucked this question up royally. I guess the best, I use the word best very loosely, was Pete Buttigieg. But it's funny, he answers this question still shittily but better than everyone else but this week um we got word that he would not move the embassy back so i mean this is 
all around, each and every single one of them shit the bed, including our favorites, Bernie, Tulsi, Warren. This isn't hard. It's a yes or no answer. And objectively speaking, according to human rights watchdogs, the answer is no. You don't need to go, you know, on this long tangent and give us this long-winded response. Just be concise. Um, no. So Kamala's wrong here. Um, let's see. Basically, everyone was wrong. Let's go to Elizabeth Warren. I think that Israel is in a really tough neighborhood. I understand that. This is they bad. face enormous challenges. What about the Palestinians? And they are our strong ally. We need a liberal democracy in that region and to work with that liberal Are they a liberal democracy, democracy if Palestinians but it is also who live the in case Israel are second need class to citizens? Encourage Liz? Our ally the way we would any good friend to come to the table with the Palestinians and to work toward this a permanent is so weak. solution. I strongly support a two state solution and I believe that a good friend says to the Palestinians She's really and to the being Israelis. Careful with her words here Come to the table to and negotiate. The, the United States cannot dictate the terms of a long term settlement with the Palestinians and the Israelis. But what it can do is urge both of them to go there and to stay out of the way, to let them negotiate the pieces that are most important to them for a lasting peace. Um, the current I've heard enough. This is not adequate. Let's hear Bernie. I have great concerns about the role that Netanyahu is playing uh, in Israel uh, and their relationship uh, with the Palestinians. Uh, as I've said many times, uh, I believe 100% in the right for Israel uh, not only to exist, but to you exist to in that. peace and security. Of course, everybody just accepts uh, but that. the role of the United States is to work with all of the entities in the region, including the Palestinians, and to do that in an even-handed way. That was such a milk toast, weak, weak answer, Bernie. I mean, even the best progressive in the race can't just even hit anywhere near the target on this. Uh, let's go to Tulsi, because Tulsi, she is the foreign policy candidate. The fact that, you know, she's having a difficult time here is so frustrating. Uh, I think that there are some challenges with Israel um, that, that need to be addressed. Could you expand on that? I think that ongoing issues that we continue to see in the conflict between Israel and Palestine are complicated, uh, but there need to be pro there there needs to be progress made uh, ultimately to make sure that both the Israeli people and the Palestinian people are able to live in peace uh, and securely. Tulsi, it is so obvious that you're avoiding the question and you're sitting on the fence. How are the progressives even fucking this question up? It's an easy question. It's an easy question. You can say, look, if you're afraid to say anything that would, you know, give off the perception that maybe you're anti-Israel, you can say, look, I believe in Israel. However, I go by what the international organizations are, are saying. I go by what the UN says. And it's obvious that they're in violation of international law. They are violating international standards of human rights. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. That's what international organizations are saying. This is easy, but progressives can't even get it right. They're all fucking it up. So, so disappointing. Every single one of them. Um, I'm good. I don't want to hear anything else because it's just going to piss me off. They're all bad. Every single one of them. That was, um, they all get an F. Sorry. They all get an F. <sighs> wow. Okay. So <laughs> that really pissed me off. Do you think President Trump has committed crimes in office? Let's go with this one because I think, again, this is another easy one. Just objectively speaking, he violated campaign finance laws. He's in violation of the emoluments clause. Ten different acts of obstruction of justice, according to the Mueller report, should be easy. Do you think, do you think President Trump has committed crimes in office? I believe this president, uh, Mr. Trump, believes himself to be above the law. It looks to me like President Trump's committed crimes in office. I do. I think he's violated the emoluments clause. Oh, I don't think there's any question that he obstructed justice. I don't know. I, I would love to see the Mueller report, and maybe we can talk about it after that.
I think it is likely that Donald Trump did they film this before the Mueller report? Office. Yes, I do. I think he may well have. Perhaps that could be true, and I think Congress is continuing its oversight duties. What Mueller did not opine on is whether or not there was obstruction of justice. Uh, and was unwilling to reach a conclusion, I'd like to see the full report. Does it seem to me that there's a very, very good case for the obstruction of justice? Absolutely. Does it seem to me that there's a very, very good case for other crimes as well, uh, certainly uh, for, for indictment? A absolutely. Certainly there's a lot of uh, evidence and uh, discussion that, that, that he might have. I can't say he that, you know, I haven't seen the, either the full Mueller report or others that crimes per se. I think it's very likely that President Trump has sealed indictments waiting for him. I don't think it's my job to determine whether he committed crimes. I think it's Congress's job. There's evidence oh, that the president on. has directed people to lie to Congress. I believe President Trump has committed crimes while in office. I think that if you read the Mueller report um, and with any objective eye, it is deeply disturbing and alarming. I don't know how anybody reads the 448 pages of the Mueller report and arrives at any conclusion other than we need to start impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump. I believe the president has committed impeachable offenses, and I think there needs to be a, a congressional investigation to draw out the facts. The Mueller report was not the end of the story. It uh, was really just part of the beginning. So I think Elizabeth Warren was probably the strongest here, although I'm a little bit confused as to the timeline here um, because it seems like they all recorded at different periods of time. So clearly Kamala Harris recorded this when uh, they hadn't seen the full Mueller report, but Elizabeth Warren did. So, I mean, I think we should kind of give Kamala the benefit of the doubt, but I think that anyone who doesn't at least say, you know, oh, well, he's certainly in violation of the Emoluments Clause. That's obvious because he didn't put his businesses in a blind trust. I mean, if you can't at a minimum say that and you're riding the fence here, then I find your answer disappointing. Okay, so let's see. What else do we want to click on here? Does anyone deserve a billion dollars? This is easy. No, they do not. Let's see what they say. Do you think anyone deserves to have a billion dollars? I mean, if they earn it. How do you earn a billion, work? Kamala? Sure. sure. This is America. Sure. If you earn it uh, fairly. Sure. Sure. Nope. Yes, there are people who deserve to have a billion dollars. Who? No, no one deserves to have a billion dollars. I don't know that anyone deserves Kirsten to have got it. a billion dollars. Deserves got nothing to do with it. I don't think anybody deserves to have a billion dollars. There are people that are lucky to have a billion dollars. Like, do I think that there's something intrinsically wrong with there being billionaires in the world? No, I do not. What troubles nope. me is the fact that the federal government so often favors the wealthy over working people. I got a lot of problem with billionaires who are not paying a fair share. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, that I, was a fence-sitting answer. I, that's a <laughs> high-class luxury. I think they should certainly pay more in taxes. Is there not some obligation that they should help uh, create opportunity or enhance the opportunity for others. I'm not sure anybody cosmically or morally deserves to have a billion dollars, but I don't hold it against them. Mm. You should. I think that people deserve to work hard and make money. That How does nice our country make answer. sure that there's Maybe. shared prosperity? If they worked hard. Uh, How do you work hard enough to get a billion? Fairly. That's the point. You can't work hard enough to get a billion. Uh, our system oh, they're is so out frustrating. Of order right now. To me, the real question is do we deserve to live in a country where half of the population can't afford $500? I think that we make a mistake in this country <laughs> when we uh, confuse dodges. wealth with worth. We need a tax system which demands that the wealthiest people in this country countries start paying their fair share of taxes. And my guess is when you have that, you're not going to have too many billionaires left. Okay. Bernie and Warren dodged the question. Tulsi Gabbard, at least she answered it. Her answer was completely wrong. The answer is no, because you can't possibly earn a billion dollars. And quite frankly, you don't need more than a couple million. So in my ideal society, we have a marginal tax rate of 100%, anything above $5 million per year. You don't need more than that. I'm sorry. Um, and maybe that's a little bit too harsh in some people's views. But um, until we start actually really reducing wealth and income inequality and solving the homelessness crisis and uh, uh, poverty in America, we need those funds more than these millionaires need that. Let me go to Tulsi's answer because I feel like there is more than a one-word answer. There had to be. 
Look, those those who uh, who work and and earn uh, money in this country is is not a bad thing. It's how they do that and what they do with it. I think matters. I think the fact that we have had such an imbalance in our country with uh, vast income inequality, where our laws benefit the very few, making it easy for the richest to get even richer while the middle class and the poor continue to struggle is what's wrong, and that's what we need to fix. So she basically said the same thing that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren said. Oh, well, you know, it's not necessarily billionaires, but it's, you know, them not paying their fair share. Um, No, billionaires are the problem. Nobody can earn that much wealth. Um, Let's see here. Describe the last time you were embarrassed. I don't care about that. Um, Let's see. What do we want to click on? I don't want this video to be too long. It's already getting pretty long. Would there be American troops in Afghanistan at the end of your first term? This is a good one. Would there be American troops in Afghanistan at the end of your first term? No. 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 Uh, There would not. There would not. Uh, I suspect not. There will not be American troops in Afghanistan at the end of my first term. Not in any sizable number. Well, I'd I'd have to look at uh, the circumstances, but it'd probably be, you know, very limited. If there were troops there, there'd be very few. No. If there were, they'd be there with a clear mission to prevent uh, terror attacks, and that's it. If there is a responsible way for us to get our troops out of Afghanistan in that time frame, there would not be any troops left. Horrible answer, Andrew. The ideal, of course, would be to remove all U.S. troops. But But. even if we could get a more stable situation that would allow for fewer troops to be there, uh, that would be a huge step forward. Uh, I will seek to pull out uh, American troops from Afghanistan who are not there uh, to train and equip or provide uh, security uh, at our embassy. As president of the United States, I would make no move in Afghanistan until first I spoke to Afghan women. So I'm like most what? Americans, I want to get our troops out of Afghanistan. I um, believe we should bring back our troops from Afghanistan. No, we need to bring our American troops home. Uh, we cannot have forever wars in this nation. So most of them got that right. The answer is um, we bring the troops home. Um, let me see what Marianne Williamson said because her answer didn't make sense. So there's got to be more context here that it makes sense. As president sense. of the United States, I would make no move in Afghanistan until first I spoke to Afghan women. I want to hear from the Afghani women. I'm very aware of the history of the Taliban in relationship to women. And so nothing happens until first I talk to them. See, this is an answer that gives me pause because here's the thing. There are human rights atrocities going on everywhere around the world. The government in Myanmar is carrying out a genocide against the Rohingya. There are numerous human rights violations in Sudan. So what I think she's missing here is that she still believes that there's a such thing as a humanitarian war. She is fundamentally misunderstanding why we're there. We're not there because we care about human rights. We're there because we want the the uh, minerals that are in Afghanistan. So her her heart is in the right place. With that being said, I don't think she is understanding why we intervene in the first place. And that worries me. Because as president, she could be misled by generals that, oh, well, there's this human rights violation here. Let's invade. There's this human rights violation here. Let's invade. Um, and I don't like that. So um, I'm not impressed with Marianne Williamson um, in these talks here. Let's see. Do you support or oppose the death penalty? Um, this is an easy answer. It's cruel and unusual punishment. And um, they shouldn't support this. Do you support or oppose the death penalty? I oppose the death penalty, and I have long held that view. I'm personally opposed to the death penalty. I always have been. I've I've always always opposed opposed the death penalty. penalty. I oppose the death 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 penalty. I support it in limited circumstances. Okay, so um, that was a bad answer. Um... (laughs) But, I mean, this is actually pretty encouraging. I wish that Joe Biden was included in this. Um, I'm realizing now because he's so forgettable that he's not here because I would like to hear his um, his responses to some of these. Um, okay. I think I'm going to do one more and um, we'll call it quits here because this is getting super long. 
Let's see. Do you think immigration is a major problem in the United States? Um, it's between that and should tech giants like Facebook, Amazon, and Google be broken up? Which one do I choose? Um, because I can already kind of predict what they're going to say about illegal immigration. Um, they're going to give a standard, you know, answer. Maybe we'll do both. So let's see what they say about tech giants, because I hope the answer is to break them up. Should tech giants like Facebook, Amazon, and Google be broken up? The answer in general is yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, I have no problem with the idea of breaking some of these companies up. Perhaps in some instances, we must have far stronger regulations. No, but I do think the Weak. antitrust division at the Department of Justice uh, could be uh, you know, better used. I think we need but to look at breaking them up. up. They may well be broken up. I don't think we need to break them up right Weak. now, but we've got to regulate them more effectively. Significantly increase the regulation of them. They need far more oversight and accountability and regulation. These tech giants need to be regulated to protect our privacy. We have to address the size down? and the power and the concentration of power that now exists. It's not healthy for our country. I think the FTC needs to be empowered to prevent and in some cases reverse the mergers of some of these uh, companies, not just in tech, but uh, across the American economy. Uh, the, my first priority is going to be that, that we ensure that privacy is something that is intact. I think it sh we should act absolutely examine whether they should be broken up. But we have processes in place to, to examine that and, and, and look at it, just as Teddy Roosevelt did, just as Franklin Roosevelt did. The temptation, though, is to Teddy say Roosevelt break them up, Roosevelt, which is frankly a 20th century solution to a 21st just century fucking set of yes no answer. I think tech giants first ought to have a lot more obligations. I worry about any presidential candidates making broad brush determinations. Oh, do you now? Because running for president means you're going to have to make some uh, pretty substantial decisions and come out with really bold policies. But we all know that uh, Cory Booker is uh, he's spineless. All right, let's do the immigration one. And we'll end on a positive note with one of the stupid questions, I guess. I don't think it's a major. Do you think illegal immigration is a major problem for the U.S.? I think we have challenges with uh, undocumented uh, immigrants in our country, and, and a lot of those challenges is by forcing them into the shadows. Illegal immigration is an issue, and Democrats have to admit that it's something that we have to confront. Republicans have to be honest about the facts that we need immigrants, that we're a country of immigrants, that we've Very got to give a pathway of citizenship here. to dreamers and others. I want to help the dreamers. We want to encourage new streams of talent into America. Undocumented immigrants need a path to citizenship. I think even the languaging of illegal immigration is a That's problem a in the United States. Yeah. Uh, I do it's not think illegal immigration is a major problem in the United States. I don't think it's a major problem, but Why I do think we going need down? to this is fix our broken immigration system. I think it's a broken system. Our broken immigration system is a major problem in this country. I think it is a problem. Uh, it is certainly not the kind of problem that Donald Trump makes it out to be. It's not as much of a problem in a, in a country right now where we have 3.8% unemployment. But that being said, we need a system where everyone plays by the rules. I think we have in this country an immigration crisis that's self-created. I think the big problem in the United States. The major problem for the United States is that we need to pass comprehensive, comprehensive immigration reform. Comprehensive immigration reform. I think that we have done nothing about immigration for so long. Why does um, this keep scrolling down? We haven't done enough to figure out a smart way get it. It to bring people down. that are in our country to citizenship. We have over 12 million undocumented immigrants here in America, and that is a major problem, yes. No. That's a bad Undocumented answer, Andrew. Undocumented immigration is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to rewrite our laws. We need to be doing more when it comes to immigration reform. I think the biggest problem we've got right now starts down in Central America. Uh, the United States has withdrawn a lot of support in Central America. It's a destabilized government. Gangs have taken over. And people are forced to flee for their lives. And as a consequence, they end up at the American border, um, whether that's what they really wanted to do or not. Illegal uh, immigration is an issue that this administration has drummed up to cause fear and paranoia. Let me go to Andrew Yang's answer, because that was like... Really bad. If you're saying that the people who are here now who are paying taxes and contributing to our economy, if you think that that's a problem, then that's very Trumpian. So we have over 12 million people who are here in this country that are undocumented, um, that we know of. I mean, it could be an, an even larger number. 
Uh, and we should not pretend that it is possible to somehow deport 12 million people. It yes, would collapse should. regional economies okay, and separate that. families. It's essentially a non-starter. Um, so right now, the status quo is we don't know who everyone is, and then uh, we have problems with that. Um, and many of these people will show up in our emergency rooms or um, get into car accidents or other things where not knowing who they are is uh, immensely problematic. And many of them are operating in an informal uh, shadow economy where we um, aren't having them integrated into the greater whole. And so I'm for a long-term path to citizenship long-term. for people who are in here and undocumented. We need to create a path forward for people to see that they have a future here in this country. And this is particularly true because many of them have kids who have known no other life but America. And it would be, again, completely inhumane to separate families on that level. So that was a little bit more thoughtful. I don't like the long-term path to citizenship because they're already here. Like, what are we waiting for them? Um, I don't like the path towards citizenship top talk. I mean, just give them citizenship, give them amnesty. Like I hate how everything has to be incrementalist and it can't be bold. We have to make sure that we take the least offensive answer on everything. It drives me nuts. So, um, okay. Now I know why they included some of these really just (laughs) anodyne like stupid questions because after you see the rest of the responses you're going to be disappointed and i know that they probably planned these before they got the answers but they're here for a reason because um yeah these were pretty disappointing um do i want to look at the court packing plan this video is already pretty long so um i kind of want to end i keep saying we're going to end let me look at the court packing uh one really quick and then we'll end on uh, a stupid question. Are you open to expanding the size of the Supreme Court? I am open Good. to that discussion. Expanding the size of the Supreme Court is something I am thinking about right now. Mm-hmm. It would make total sense to institute a, t- a term limit of 18 years. And it also would make total sense to increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court. I believe we need to reform the Supreme Court, but it's not just about the number of justices. I don't know that expanding the size of the Supreme Court is the best way to address legitimate concerns we have with its objectivity. I'm open to any idea that can make sure a woman's right of choice is protected. I am open to it. I'm open to it. I am open to that. I'm open. I don't think that expanding the size of the Supreme Court solves the problem. I don't believe that expanding the size of the Supreme Court is the answer. I I am not. I do not think expanding the Supreme Court makes sense. No. 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 Where does that stop? It's a race to the bottom. I'm not convinced that expanding the size of the Supreme Court is going to fix anything. Roosevelt tried that in the 1930s. Didn't work so well. Expanding the size of it, I think, would require a national discussion. You know, I I would be open to giving Merrick Garland a seat because I think what happened to him was terrible. I think what Mitch McConnell did was unpatriotic and in many ways an attack on the Constitution. Let me see what Tulsi and Bernie said in the uh, expanded answer here Um, because I don't like Bernie's answer I don't Um, the point of threatening them with the court packing plan was to get them to stop undoing all of the New Deal reforms like we call it the Lochner era because the Supreme Court was essentially rogue and he was threatening to pack the courts to scare the shit out of them. So if Bernie isn't looking at that as a strategy, that's super disappointing. I think the Roosevelt tried that in the 1930s, didn't work so well uh, for him. Packing the courts is a great idea when you're in power, not such a great idea when your political opponents are in power. And so, you know, uh, if you uh, go from nine to 13 and go 13 from seven to 17, uh, it never ends, but I, I am open. Uh, to the idea of rotating judges uh, out of the Supreme Court uh, into courts of appeals, for example, to allow them to get a new uh, look at, at, at the real world that is that is out there. But I'm not in favor of packing the courts. Yeah, that's, that's not a really um, good answer from Bernie, in my opinion. I get what he's saying about, oh, well, you know, if Democrats, when they expand the court, then Republicans will expand the court. Well, once you ex- expand the court, then you try to stop Republicans from doing the same thing. Like, you have to fight dirty and fight fire with fire. They stole a Supreme Court seat from President Obama. So now all bets are off. Civility is gone. Now you just, um, you take back the court if they're going to be 
just doing the bidding of corporate America and letting capitalism infiltrate in our democracy. Like something has to be done. So the idea that he's open to like rotating them between the circuit courts and whatnot, that's a step in the right direction. But something has to be done. Like we can't allow the Supreme Court to fuck up the country for a generation. That's just completely unacceptable. Let's go to Tulsi here. Uh, I don't think that expanding the size of the Supreme Court solves the problem that we're facing where the court has increasingly become a partisan political entity. That's true. Even if you add uh, more numbers to the Supreme Court, you're still not going to solve the problem. How, unfortunately, uh, those who are appointed are largely appointed on partisan reasons rather than making sure our Supreme Court justices are chosen based on their commitment to upholding our and defending our constitution. Yeah, um, I would have liked to know how you depoliticize the court then. But, you know, um, it's not my number one issue. All right, that's it. I'm not going to do any more. Let me just go ahead and we'll get to a stupid question here. What's your comfort food on the campaign trail? And then we'll end there. So that way we're leaving on at least a somewhat positive note. Unless they fuck this question up too. Then I don't know what to What's say. What's your comfort food on the campaign trail? When you're a vegan, that means uh, lots of veggies on the go. I try to stay away from it, but vegan cupcakes is, is probably a real threat on the trail. <laughs> Any kind of fast food. I love a good hamburger. I mean, you can't beat a burger for a quick classic American meal. Grilled chicken sandwich from McDonald's, no sauce. Two of them. A baked potato. Italian sausage sandwich at Paskey in Pueblo, Colorado. I think if I've got one go-to, it's like pulled pork. Kind bars are my comfort food. I do have a sweet tooth, and I will look for those little bowls of, you know, M&Ms or mints. It was M&Ms, but I've taken an oath now to lay off of the M&Ms to maintain uh, belt uh, security. Last time out. We did a trip to the West Coast and I gained three pounds in four days. So uh, there's too much comfort food. <laughs> I have no comfort food. The word got out that I like yeah, beef jerky. Do. And so uh, uh, people have been kind enough to uh, uh, give that to me on the road sometimes. I'm an ice cream guy. I don't have a comfort food. I have a comfort drink, which is uh, iced tea. It's really comfort coffee. Um, my favorite coffee is a mocha. Glass of whiskey at the end of the night. Probably chips and guacamole. French fries. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good french fry, or a few, or many, or just the whole thing. Now this just made me hungry. So now I'm angry and I'm hungry. Um, but that's it. Let's stop the video. This is like three and a half hours long. Um, you know, I'll link to this down below if you want to check it out yourself. If you want to see the other uh, questions, some of these might be interesting. Like, do you think that it's possible for the next president to stop climate change? Um, I already know what they're going to say, which is why I didn't click it. I think it's possible for us to kind of lead the way and get the rest of the world to come to the table and get us on that trajectory. They're going to say something like that. In an ideal world, would anyone own handguns? They're all going to say yes. So I've, I've got the main questions that I wanted to see answered out of the way. But, you know, I, I like that the New York Times did this. Hopefully they continue to release these because I think these are really helpful and getting to know where the candidates stand on a range of issues. By and large, the ones that were really important... Um, I was super disappointed. Like the Israel Palestine, I hope that they all see this and they reflect because each and every single one of them gave an absolutely atrocious response. Even our favorites, even Bernie, even Tulsi, even Warren, um, even Yang, they need to do better here. But with that being said, uh, this is this is insightful. So I'm glad that they released this. You could support the Humanist Report at Patreon dot com slash humanist report but trust me i'd have way more supporters on patreon if that was my podcast sad <laughs>